Here we are with Fred and Eric again. Ten Plagues Part 2. Go! This is part 2. This is, uh, we ran out of time on the previous thing. Sorry about that. We were on the fourth plague, which was the swarm. You know, the interesting thing, back up to the... There was the blood, the water turning to blood. And then there was the frogs. The, the word frog is zafarda. Zadi, pe, resh, dalit, ayam. So, Zafar, well, you could say the word frog is Zafarda, Z but it kind of looks like two words joined into one. Zafar is a word that means bird, like Zephora was Moshe's wife, which means little birdie, like calling somebody birdie. It means to tweet or to chirp or to croak or to make this sound in the morning, and then Dalit ayah, da, is the word for knowledge. So you might say that the word frog is to tweet knowledge. What do you do with that? It would, I, we could sit here and go on for an hour about what do you do with that, or how do you read more into it. And part of it is to look at the each individual letter's meaning, pictographically, as well as how it affects other words by studying the dictionary. In other words, you... You take the spelling of a word with similar spellings, you add other prefixes and suffixes, and you look at other, put yods and vavs in between, and besides the standard prefix and suffixes, you can add any other letter as a prefix or a suffix, which changes the word completely, but it's then trying to notice patterns, correlations. How is the language constructed by building these letters on top of each other and coming up with words? And it's, you might say, making the assumption right out of the gate that you can do that. Mm -hmm. Now, I've read about other people who study Hebrew, and some people do not like at all what I'm doing. And they say that it cannot be done. And they, in fact, just read this book. A very interesting book. Nice cover. Look at that. The Writing of God, the Secret of the Real Mount Sinai by Miles Jones, PhD. Real nice cover, great, you know, pretty nice artwork. He's Moshe is standing there going, wow. He's never seen this writing before. The suggestion is that Elohim gave this writing devoid of pictographic reference. In other words, at the giving of the words on Mount Sinai, what this book is saying is that the hieroglyphic connection was severed. In other words, this was, a, I, I believe the number was 1447 BC is where he dates the Mount Sinai event to. I usually say Moshe is somewhere around 1500 BC because if you look in 500 year increments, Abraham was about 2000, Moshe is about 1500, mm -hmm. David about 1000, mm -hmm. and Solomon right after him, you know, 1900. Mm -hmm. Daniel's about 500, mm -hmm. the Maccabees, Alexander the Great, about 300, mm -hmm. Yeshua at zero. Right. It's just a way of, in big blocks of time, staging right. world history, right. according to the biblical. That, that's all. But the point is, this is a very interesting book. Miles Jones did a great job of looking at the artifacts and trying to prove that receiving script written as words on Mount Sinai never had been done before and changed the history of human consciousness because it went from Mount Sinai as they wandered through the Saudi, actually it wasn't through the Sinai Peninsula, it was through the Saudi Arabian, what we now know as the Saudi Arabian Peninsula, they went down to what we now call Yemen, which is down at the southern border, and it became, you might say, they didn't drop off knowledge, but basically what happened is the people there picked up on the fact that, hey, there's an alphabet that you can spell words and, and derive other ways of thinking. Then they were limited to the hieroglyphic, or the cuneiform was the other language group that was, that was written, and you, you couldn't think certain ways because you didn't have an alphabet which spelled words. And so what he's studying here and elaborating on was that 
by having an alphabet that was not locked into the hieroglyphic connected. In other words, Aleph is drawn like an ox head, and so it means ox, or ox is a picture. Well, it wasn't necessarily an ox head in you know, Egyptian hieroglyphic because they didn't have individual letters. They had words. So if you looked at a picture of an ox, mm -hmm. in Hebrew the word for bull would be par, mm -hmm. pay resh. Like we get the word pariah, that's a aspect of the same word. But the point is, so in Egyptian hieroglyphics, you'd have to take a syllable, par, and like there's a word that is called pardes, and I don't know what the picture of deaths would be. Well, here's the desk. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to make something up here. I take a pic, here, here's an elephant, that's like a bull elephant. So let's call that a par, and let's call this a desk. So I show you two pictures, an elephant and a desk, and I say, well, there's the word that means paradise. Huh? What? An elephant and a desk? No, it's pardes. Pardes is the word paradise. Mm -hmm. What's paradise? Well, the peresh dalit sheen is if you look at it, it's an acronym for four ways to study scripture. Peshat, Ramez, Dras, and Sod. Okay. Not Sheen, it would be uh, some, excuse me. But anyway, the point is, that's the way language worked back then. They looked at pictures as syllables that spelled concepts, and the invention, this is what Miles Jones is saying, the invention that Yahuwah gave to Moshe on Mount Sinai of words that are spelled by letters, which are actually consonants, mm -hmm. which then you combine consonants to form syllables, like mm -hmm. par is p and er. That's two, mm -hmm. not just one picture. Mm -hmm. Innovation, completely mm -hmm. novel, never been done before, and that changed everything. And then when it got, so they went down to south of Arabia, those people picked it up, and then they went north, and those people picked it up, and then they went further north up to Lebanon, and by the time you get to David and Solomon's era of about 1000 BC, city of Byblos, a Phoenician city, suddenly it explodes and goes to Greece and all across the world from there, and so they say that the Semitic alphabet was actually invented by Phoenicians in the city of Byblos around 1050 BC. The problem is Moshe existed about 1500 BC, a good 400 years earlier. So how did the Phoenicians in Byblos invent the Semitic alphabet? So you look in any encyclopedia, that's what they'll tell you. And Miles Jones here is discussing the fact that it just doesn't line up. And so he's promoting that Yahuwah himself gave the script to Moshe, which is why Moshe is standing here going like, It's never appeared on the face of the earth before. But there's a problem. According to the Torah, this event happened in Exodus 31. Yahweh called Moshe up and he says, I have written these words on tables of stone. And he gave them to him. And of course, Moshe was holding them and he came back. And there's the golden calf thing going on. And so he threw them down and broke them. And then he had to go back and get a second set. But that's Exodus 31 when this happened. But in Exodus 24... Six chapters before, it says Moshe wrote all the words of Yahweh. Hmm. How did he write all the words of Yahweh? They didn't exist yet. <laughs> and in chapter 17, verse 14, Yahweh told Moshe to write the words down. Hmm. And that was a good seven chapters before it says he did write them down. Where did he get those words? If... Yahweh gave the Hebrew alphabet to Moshe on tables of stone in Exodus 31. How did Moshe write the words of the Sefer Brit, the scroll of the covenant in Exodus 24? Mm -hmm. Now, the only way for him to have done that would have been to write them in Egyptian hieroglyphics or cuneiform. Wait a minute! There's a problem. Egyptian hieroglyphics were pictures, glyphs, Grammaton drawings of their deities, pagan, heathen idolatry, which is why Miles Jones says the giving of the Hebrew script was that each letter is devoid of pictographic reference and that that breaks the second commandment of graven images and therefore every one of the Hebrew letters in this alphabet 
that Yahweh put together on Mount Sinai had no pictographic reference. These are the Hebrew flame letters he's referring to. Well, if you look real close here, these are what I would call Paleo-Hebrew or ancient oh, Hebrew. They're not even flame letters. Oh, okay. So he's saying that, Miles Jones is saying that to consider that letters of the Hebrew alphabet mm -hmm. have a picture value is a graven image, which is idolatry, and that Yahweh would not tolerate that, that that's a sin. It's breaking the second commandment. And what he provided Moshe on the tables of stone were just little symbols drawn with no picture reference. Of course, he commanded them to put uh, images of pomegranates in the tabernacle and... Uh, yeah, but those weren't trees. alphabetic letters. And that... You know, those that are... The thing is... Those are images of Those are created, images. created objects. Angels. Angels. There was a couple bowls that yeah. Solomon made. Yeah, but, but maybe those were missing the mark. Maybe those were sin. But, but, but the point that, that I'm making about this is that I've been saying exactly the opposite. I've been saying that the Paleo-Hebrew letters most definitely are pictures. As a matter of fact, they're pictures that are keyed to the Mishkan pattern, mm -hmm. which Alex, I mean, excuse me, Miles Jones doesn't see. Mm -hmm. Mark Brown, I mean, no, Michael Brown, right? His name is Michael Brown? Doctor. Dr. Michael, Michael Brown. Brown. <laughs> and Michael Heiser also <laughs> don't see it. Mm -hmm. So just for the record, Miles Jones, Michael Brown, and Michael Heiser completely disagree with everything I'm saying, and they're, they, they, they're essentially saying that this is heresy. Mm -hmm. So this is volatile information, just so you know. Mm -hmm. And what I'm saying is that because these Hebrew letters, the pictographic letters, are keyed to this Mishkan pattern, and that it's Yahweh's revelation of himself, these letters, for all intents and purposes, are Yahoo. Now, that way you can draw the pictographs of Paleo-Hebrew, and it's not idolatry, it's himself. Mm -hmm. Pretty outrageous statement. But the point is, if Moshe is going to write all the words of Yahweh, they can only be done with these letters, because these are his letters. Mm -hmm. And they reference character, nature, attribute, thought, mind, heart, Mashiach, covenant, all of which are his stuff. If you try to write those words in Egyptian hieroglyphics, you're using images of pagan deities. Right. You can't do it. So Moshe could not write all the words of Yahweh using Egyptian hieroglyphics or a cuneiform. Right. The only way that he can write them is with these letters. So then these letters had to predate mm -hmm. the giving of the tables in Exodus 31. Mm -hmm. So where did Moshe come up with then these letters? They didn't exist. If they didn't exist until Exodus 31, how did he write them in Exodus 24? And how was he told to write them in Exodus 17? Well, and Yahweh wrote the, the commandments on the tables of stone with his finger. What, That's what, Exodus 31. Well, ex, Exodus, in Exodus 20, he gave the, the instructions. He spoke them. Spoke yeah. Yes, that's true. So the, the first place that the word ketub... The word for right shows up is Exodus 17, 14, then Exodus 24, 4, mm -hmm. and then Exodus 24, 31, he always says all the words that I have written, and then he hands it to him in Exodus right, 31. Right, right. So what I'm saying is that there's a mystery here. Sure. And this book addresses certain aspects, but I disagree. Mm -hmm. I have a different point of view based on certain things I've been studying, just so people know. Mm -hmm. Great book. The guy has very wonderful things to say in here. Very similar to that other book we looked at about the case of Exodus. He references that book. He references the event crossing mm -hmm. the Red Sea. But where did this language come from? Where did these pictures come from? And what do they mean? Mm -hmm. The greatest scholars of this day, the greatest minds we have, Michael Heiser, Michael Brown, and Miles Jones, disagree with what I'm saying here, the Erectology study of the Mishkan pattern in Paleo-Hebrew. Just so you know. But at least you brought up some points to... Uh question them about oh yeah how why they gloss over those and not even bring them up there's some great stuff in here just just mm -hmm. just saying okay but anyway so i'm acknowledging that this is controversial information but again if you go to malachi 316 yahweh says then those who had a fear and honor a reverence a regard of him got together 
And they discussed amongst themselves his Shem, his name, fame, renown, reputation, the occupation of all his concerns. That's what the word Shem means, which is what we're doing. And again, the reason why we're doing these videos is to facilitate you, the audience, people watching this, to be doing that. And he said, hey, and he called one of his malachim, one of his angels, to say, hey, bring a scroll, grab a sephir, and write it down right here next to me. Write the names of those humans who take their time and effort to regard my name. Mm -hmm. Write their names down. And on the day that I bring about, on the day when I reveal my treasure, then you'll see the difference that it makes. The distinction of those who regard my name, mm -hmm. I will, because these are my greatest treasure. So, again... He doesn't say they figured out the right pronunciation of his name. They figured out the right calendar. Why? They knew exactly what the meanings of these letters are. Those who study his stuff, those who take the time to discuss amongst themselves. So my take on the matter is if we sit here for an hour making a video talking about Yahweh's stuff, then anybody who wants to participate by watching, by thinking, by looking stuff up, by just pondering, is now spent an hour doing the qualifications of Malachi 3.16, mm -hmm. and maybe you'll be, your name will be written in that book too. I mean, that is got to be the greatest success in life, is to get your name written into that book, besides the book of life, but I'm just saying, you know, to be Yahweh's personal treasure and have your name written on the scroll right there in front of him, mm -hmm. that's hitting the big time, boy. That's, uh... <laughs> that's the entirety of life's purpose. Mm -hmm. Well, there you go. That pretty well sums it up. <laughs> Seriously, I mean, what could be, what could be greater? So we are again. We're trying to conduct this effort towards the pursuit of not only the greatest, but it's the only great thing in life. I mean, in spite of all these wonderful things that some of these relics bring our attention to a safari, a sailing ship, war, and aeronautics, you know, great cars. It's like, eh, it's all just riffraff. It's jetsam. <laughs> this is the treasure, his words. Anyway, let's go back to the study here. We, we left off the previous video on the fourth plague Third plague, which was, we said lice, but you know, in the dictionary, the same word for lice is also vermin. Mm -hmm. And the third of the Ten Commandments had to do with taking his name in vain, or bringing his name to nothingness. And you had an, an interesting comment about the vermin, the... Well, the way that uh, animals that travel in... in uh in flocks or in herds, uh, this, their, their navigation system, bees, uh, um, flies, birds, you know, have this incredible innate ability to navigate. And, you know, if there's one commandment that seems to be a, a navigator, a, uh, a commandment that points us always back to the direction of Yahweh, it's that third commandment of His name. His name will lead us back to who He is, to His Moedim, to His Sabbaths, to his instructions, to his Torah, to his Messiah, to his kingdom. So if, uh, if that concept of navigation and an attack on navigation is, uh, is, is part of that plague, then um, it really correlates to me with the third commandment, which is really the navigation that Yahweh gave us back to him, his name, which we've disregarded. There's an interesting thing, the way these... Uh these plagues, if you, if you simply read what they are, blood, frogs, lice, a swarm, livestock, dust boils, it, it seems like they're just randomly this than that, they stand alone. Why did he pick the next one? Who knows? But if you think of them as one playing into the next, playing into the next, and then you compare them, as I said, to the Ten Commandments, and then you compare that to the constellations and try to read... We're just playing with patterns, we're just trying to look, we're just investigating, we're just contemplating that the one that had to do with his name had to do with lice, and then the next one having to do with the Shabbat has to do with the swarm. 
So there's lice or vermin, whatever that is. I mean, just because it says it's lice in English doesn't mean it was, because what does the word mean? In the dictionary, it could be either one. And then the swarm is the word ayin resh bet, a rev, which is this blending. That's more like this horde, because the word for a rev is the same word for evening, where you get this blending. You can't distinguish one from the other. Mm -hmm. And that has to do with, that's the last thing I read, sends confusion as a missile-like projection, dispatching disinformation to scramble comprehension. Demonic interventions must appease the prevailing forces, powers unknown, causing disturbances, weird science. These are, these are concepts that I find embedded within this phraseology of, of written in Hebrew. Mm -hmm. So what I got out of this is to say, if we don't regard the Shabbat, I, let me put it this way. I've heard that in the Garden of Eden, humans were given jurisdiction over the planet. And then when they ate the forbidden fruit, they relinquished authority to the devil. That's the Christian version of the story of Adam and Eve in the garden and eating the forbidden fruit. So now the Satan, the devil, the adversary, is the, is the ruler of the world because they gave it over to him. That same concept is embedded within this thing of the swarm, hmm. which is the fourth plague. That somehow, and if it's keyed to the, the Sabbath day, then what I see is it's saying, if we don't keep the Sabbath day, we are forsaking our jurisdiction mm -hmm. and giving it over to an adversary of confusion, mm -hmm. just like the story of Adam and Eve giving it over to mm. the serpent in the garden by eating the forbidden fruit. Mm. And we could sit there and say, Adam and Eve, you stupid idiots, what would you do that for? Thanks a lot. Now look at the fine mess we've got us in. Mm. But we're doing the same thing if we don't regard his day. And then the guidance system having to do with his name, mm -hmm. he gave us a system like having a compass, having a watch, having a plumb line. He gave us tools by which to navigate truth mm -hmm. in his name is a tool, mm -hmm. but we don't even know it. We don't even know its use. And for us to disregard his name because it was changed in the Bible. I mean, I can read a Bible verse that says, I am the Lord, that is my name. And I read it, it's like, okay, that's what he said, don't yell at me. Truth. I read it right there in the, in, in the God-breathed King James. I am the Lord, that is my name. And then I look at those words and I realize, that was never said. It could not be more wrong. Come on. It's completely not true. It is not his name. It is not his name, and he never said those words. Never said those words. And I know this is disturbing words to hear, to have some people hear this. What did he say? What did he mean? And how should we respond to it? That's what this is about. What he said was, Ani Yahuwah, or Anoki Yahuwah El Heka. I am Yahweh, your Elohim. Shami, Hazah, this, my name. That's what he said. But you don't know that if you don't read Hebrew. <laughs> this is all about getting back on track. This isn't to disparage or to defame or to insult anybody. I'm not even trying to insult Miles Jones. I just have a different perspective. Yeah. I think it was President Adams who said facts are stubborn things. <laughs> <laughs> they get in the way of, of a good party. Let's get on to the next one. It's the plague of the livestock being wiped out, tormented, sick. I mean, some kind of a plague of infection and death wiped out just most of the Egyptian livestock. Mm -hmm. What I read into this is reciprocity, mm -hmm. payback in spades, as blood cries out from the earth. What has been bought with violence must be paid for by severe, madly, heavy epidemic of pestilence. Mm. And it goes back to the commandment about honor your mother and father so that you will have a long life. In other words, this was the first commandment with promise, I believe, that was said elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Honor your mother and father 
and something will happen. In other words, this will bring that. It's like the whole scales of balance or the teeter-totter effect. This is a cause, that's an effect. And what it lines up with this is that if you have, he says in another place, that if evil men build their house, build their wealth with violence by stealing from others, they are building it up only to lose it mm -hmm. to some other violent act. Mm -hmm. you, you can't hold on to it because there's a system at work in the world. And those who think that it's just the survival of the fittest, the strongest win, they, the strongest get to rule, the slyest, the sneakiest, the most corrupt always seem to maneuver and get ahead. That's what it looks like, but that's not the way he built it. Mm -hmm. Yahuwah, the creator of heaven and earth, built a system. The Egyptians didn't understand his system. Neither did many other, neither do the Americans, apparently. But the point is, he built a system and he's telling his people that if we listen to him, he will enforce his system. Could, can you say what you were saying a little bit earlier about Thomas Jefferson? Can you just throw that out as a reference of what appears to be and what is? Sure. Well, in the, the, the context of what we've read here has changed my whole picture of history because I was taught as a Christian that God personally directed all, all of history, ev everything, everything that is done, everything that has happened, that he personally directed. And of course Jefferson is castigated as, you know, non-Christian almost because he believed he was a deist. He believed that, that the Creator set the world in motion and at some point he allowed it to just go on its own. And as I read these words, Yahweh promised to be with his people and to bless them as long as he he was their Elohim, and they were his people. But they clearly turned his back on them. And at some point, he turned his back on them. And my picture of history is so much different now, because I see the, the chaos, the cruelty in the world as happening far outside of his direction. Um, uh, we cannot lay the, the, the crimes, the inhumanity, the torture that has been done at his feet because I believe that he has to some extent allowed mankind to have their way with this world and he's he's waiting for a people who will seek him who will who will draw his attention to them by their by their love their determination to return to these words and to walk into them again Jeremiah speaks of uh, him saying, uh, I will show you a new thing, a, a woman will encircle a man. Rather than a man pursuing a woman, he's waiting for his people, his woman, his bride, mm -hmm. to encircle him, to be so thrilled with his words and his kingdom that they, she, invite him back to be involved again. This study that we're doing is, again, to conduct, to facilitate that event to happening. It's in Jeremiah where it is, was it chapter 31 or chapter 30, where it's talking about the recovery of the kingdom mm -hmm. yes. for the 12 tribes of Israel to come mm -hmm. back as a confederation right. Right. as his favored people and right. take over their rightful place of jurisdiction of the planet, which right. we were talking over the mystery of taking this <clears throat> breastplate, the, the, the chosen of the high priest, and it folds over and then it folds over again and flipping the chessboard, as it were, white spaces from black. I believe that this is an event that will happen because he said he so. He said it would happen. He said it would happen. And so what we're trying to do, the motive behind what we're doing here, is to get everybody to get on board with saying, hey, Yahweh, please come back and be our Elohim. Right. We will yeah. listen right. as you spoke and right. we'll do what you said. See, we're doing what you said. See, we're sitting down on Shabbat. See, we're reading your words. See, we're calling you by your name. What else did he say to do? Let's look through these pages. It's not about us. It's not about our effort. It's because that's what he said he wants to do and that he's waiting for a people who will beckon him back, right. which goes against certain doctrines, certain theologies, certain things that people already believe from other points of view, which they're welcome to have, but I'm trying to not invent a point of view, I'm trying to find the point of view that he told us he we should have. Mm -hmm. 
which is what you've expressed here. And there's other verses we could reference, but the point is, again, the reason why we're doing this is to bring Yahweh's attention back to his people because his people have brought their attention back to him. Mm -hmm. And we're just trying to facilitate bringing the people of Israel's attention back to the word of their Elohim, Yahuwah, Zavot. And other people seem to just be focused on a date. When is he coming back? Oh, he's going to come back this time. Oh, he's going to come back at this certain time. Oh, before that we got X amount of years of tribulation. All this crap. We could get passed over just like every other generation. And people start reading these. It's just a distraction and as far as I'm concerned. Whether or not calamity will come is not my issue. Certainly yeah. it talks about calamity yeah. coming, but what should be our issue is what did he say and how do we do it? That's the only focus. And my sense is that if we are simply looking at his words and putting our proactive efforts to do them to the best of our confused ability, our, our bewildered understanding, but we're doing it out of a pure heart of simply trying to be pleasing to him because he said so. Then he'll take care of the calendar. He'll, he'll take care of the this and that. You shouldn't have done it that way. You should do it this way a little bit there. But we're just trying to get his attention back onto us to restore us as his favorite people. And he'll take care of the rest. So I'm not saying that no trouble will ever happen to anybody. What I'm saying is that he said that if we're his people, he would care for us and protect us. There's, that, there's this uh, picture on here in the uh, letter Yod. This, it looks like this hand of King Kong holding the delicate girl. And that's Yahweh's hand yeah. holding us and protecting us and caring for us right. gently and delicately, though it's this massive Yod. You can find a few chapters in, in uh, Daniel talking about this beast, this, this stomping creature that, you know, destroys everything in its path. You can find a chapter in Matthew 24 that speaks of tribulation. You can find a bit in Revelation. But I'm telling you, I've documented at least 92 chapters in this book that speak of Yahweh wanting to bless us with the restoration of the kingdom, wanting to restore his people to the place he always wanted them to be where he wants us to teach his name and his ways to the nations, and he wants to bless us beyond our wildest imagination. 92 chapters. The only topic in this entire book that I could say has more coverage than that is his name, which appeared nearly 7,000 times. But nearly 100 chapters in here, he's telling us he wants to reestablish the kingdom and bless us. On not, the face of this not, earth, right. on in this, this temporal earth. realm, exactly. not in the heavenly by and by. Well, even exactly. in those in those plagues, how many affected his kids against Egypt? You know, they got the first plagues affected everybody. Right, and then but said, I'm mildly, and then it's mind. like, yeah, yeah. And then the the crap hit the fan for the. Uh, That's right. That's right. So if we're so focused on the tribulation and on problems coming, we're identifying with the wrong camp. Yeah, the camp exactly. that receives his blessing, his people, the people who keep these words, he wants nothing but good for them. Hell, just yeah. like living through that forest fire in July. Yeah. It was it was an event that I, I treasure. Yeah. Because I saw him actively actively working on I was working my butt off too, but he was orchestrating this thing and it was yeah. just I'm in awe. Yeah. I'm running around that place just joyous and the firefighters like this guy's crazy. You know, I said, I want you guys to acknowledge there's a miracle happening here. This yeah. wind hasn't been this way. Yeah. We have the creator of heaven and earth out here actively orchestrating this fire. Yeah. And they started to catch on to that fact. And that was really awesome. And to if you don't believe it, I tell any one of you listening, look up the fire maps for the Ferguson fire. And you will see an outline of where that fire extended. And in the middle of it is a little tiny circle. We're the only little circle. And that is my brother's That's property. Yahuwah. And that is Yahuwah who put his line of defense around it this, was amazing. this man's makes property. It almost makes me want to cry. And it, it's on the maps, on, on the internet. You and again, I want to personally thank everybody that prayed for us. Every time I read through that on my page and see people's comments, it yeah. chokes me up and makes me cry. Just yeah. Uh, yeah. the outpouring of everybody and the prayer. It's just, it was incredible. It was a, it was a life event that... I'm sure glad I witnessed. And that, that fire went all the way around you. Every side. And didn't, didn't touch you. Yeah. 
The next plague, the sixth plague, was dust and boils. So he picked up dust, he threw it in the air, and it became boils. So again, we could look at that in English and say, well, it was just, that's a weird one. Why did he do that? Well, I don't know. But remember, these things have to make a declaration about his Shem so that all the world knows him. Again, reading into what this because says. Because he said they did. He said they would declare his name. So what I see in this is, is these phrases, if I'm translating these words from the Hebrew, this is what I read. Secret utterances casting spells as pollen brings an eruption of struggles germinating madness such as conspiracy theories, anarchy, distrust, revolution, and cultural insanity. Hmm. So what's this saying? It's, what I think that all these, this is the sixth plague here, what, I, what I'm seeing is that Yahweh is saying the Egyptian Empire has conducted its politics, its culture, its economy, its religion that's spreading over the earth in a certain way. And this is what it's bringing. It's bringing enchantment of sorcery. It's bringing some pantheon of deities like all these other cultures. It's, it's bringing supposed knowledge, but it's actually wrong. It's bringing altered DNA, genetically modifying, thus eliminating fruitfulness and fertility. It's bringing a disturbance to the powers, the demonic entities, whatever that means. It's losing the jurisdiction that humanity was designed to have. It's building an empire on crimes that are going to demand a reprisal and even a greater force that makes them lose that instead of building for health and success, it's, it's building towards ruin and devastation. And because they're entrusting their powers to secret spells and utterances of some form of, you might call it witchcraft, it's actually as a pollen germinating madness, insanity, anarchy, revolution, it's all going to backfire. Everything that Egyptian culture, religion, and politics was doing is going to backfire. And all that Yahuwah did was bring it about, all of a sudden compressed into these ten plagues and made it happen then and there as a display to the world and said, I'm the opposite. And where he declared his opposition was in the Ten Commandments, which is why we can take the Ten Commandments and correlate them side by side with the Ten Plagues and see them back and forth. Hmm. So that plague after the one that said, honor your mother and father, isn't it do not kill? Was that the one? You know, I had these things written down, and again, I had a, did a bad job of uh, do not kill. Thinking that you can build your kingdom with criminal events, like I said, is just, it's going to have a backlash effect. And the people that built the British Empire, the American Empire, the Soviet Empire, whatever, I'm not pointing at them in particular, those are just the latest powers on the face of the earth. It's all going to backfire. It has to backfire because Yahweh said so. Anyway, the next of the Ten Commandments was don't commit adultery. The next of the plagues was fire and hail. You got steel. Let's see, six, yes. Don't commit adultery, right? So, what I read on this one, because the words of Yahweh have been despised, overruled by mood and tradition, overruled by religion and folly, even so the, the indictment is... The attitude serves as a bearing or a stanchion such that the attitude projects into real experience. So 
if you have a pulley, you're going to have this bearing and you have a rope pulling against that. If you have a boat and you have this, isn't it called a stanchion, that, mm -hmm. that anchor point and you can pull against it? Yeah. Okay, so the attitudes that we have, <clears throat> if our culture becomes a, a manifestation of mood, tradition, religion, folly, it becomes that on uh, the fulcrum upon which everything else is based. Okay, so the point is, what I see here is Yahweh saying, I will, Yahweh saying of himself, I will walk as you prescribe. Mm -hmm. We think of him as this monster, mm -hmm. and what comes is pounding hail, sure. just pushing, as it were, footprints into the earth, smashing, destroying, and then the hail was mixed with fire, and according to Emmanuel Belikovsky, that was a celestial event that brought this. That's a whole other story in uh, Worlds in Collision. You might want to read that book. But the point is, Yahweh's making a statement about himself. Why should he send huge pieces of hail pounding like fists into the ground, smashing, ruining, burning, devastating, I believe what this is saying is he's saying, I will be the monster that you believe me to be. He brought his children of Israel out of Egypt. He said he'd give them the promised land. They said, you only brought us out here apparently to kill us because there wasn't enough graves in Egypt. You brought us out here to starve us to death, to thirst us to death. You brought us out here because you hate us. And he said, essentially, if you keep saying that, that's what's going to happen. They kept saying it, and that's what happened. Okay, 40 years, you're all going to die in the desert. It didn't have to be the reality. The people brought that reality upon themselves mm -hmm. because they insisted on their attitude contradicting mm -hmm. what he said his words were, what he said his heart was, what he said his mind was toward them. They refused to believe it, mm -hmm. intentionally believed the opposite, and so he right. brought about them, upon them, the reality that they insisted upon. I think that's the great danger in Christianity and in the Hebrew Roots Messianic movement of constantly focusing on tribulation and on trouble and on being drug through the worst sort of experiences. If that's what we expect our Elohim to do, then that's what will happen. But he, he says over and over, he wants to bless us. He wants us to return to these words so that he can reestablish the kingdom, so that he can bring the wealth of the world to our feet and the, the, the men of renown and of greatness to us to learn about his name and his ways. We must hold on to that reality yes. that you just expressed. Yes. The purpose of this talk, again, is to change our thinking, to change our minds, to change our hearts, to change our hope. Hatikva, the hope, the expectation. That's the name of the national anthem of Israel, the land right now. Hatikva, the hope. And the hope is, as the song says for them, to be restored to the land. But the hope is that for Yahweh to be our Elohim, our champion, our Hebrew, Ani le dori ve dori li, I am my beloved, my beloved is mine. That he cares for us, that he will not drag us through this right. stuff, but if we focus on the threats of tribulation and him turning his back, then that's exactly what's okay. going to happen, and we brought it upon ourselves. And part of this thing of reading through this plagues is that it's not just a story to tell the Egyptians, it's tell this story to your children year after year. That's a commandment which we, the brother Yehuda apparently has done, we have failed to do because it speaks of the mechanics of the reality of how our behavior, our intention, our efforts, our heart, our, our focus of our hopes bring about the reality that is his heart expressed through these words. And if we don't regard these words, if we don't know his heart, then we will bring upon ourselves a different reality that didn't have to happen to us. Even our picture of him determines who he is to us. If our picture of him is a picture of one who wants to drag us through hell, that's, that's what's going to happen. happen. But if our picture of him is one who wants to reestablish the kingdom and bless us beyond our imagination... That is what he's promised. Yeah, I don't. I just can't see a loving father beating up or allowing his 
probably to get beat up. The interesting thing about the source of those doctrines are indeed within Scripture. So the people that believe yeah, that and teach that qualify it with Bible verses. Sure. And I'm not arguing head-to-head, -head, verse to verse with them. I'm saying this is what seems to be the message embedded within the Chosen, the uh, breastplate of the high priest that we talked about a little bit ago. This seems to be the message embedded in the constellations. That seems to be the message embedded within the Mishkan, the Aleph Bet, within the ten plagues. The message is, if we think of him to be the monster who wants to kill us, then he will be the monster that will kill us. And if we think of him as be the champion, our Elohim, our Dodi, our beloved, then that's what he'll be. And it's up to us to hear the words, choose to believe it, and then respond to him accordingly from our hearts. Next plague, locust. It arrives, burning anger, multiplying devastation. Wait a minute, didn't we just say he didn't want to do that? Hang on. Your borders are a sieve, holes eroding. The picture of locusts eating holes there's this imagery of a skull with eye sockets too big or them chewing bigger holes into something or your borders just leaking and, and being invaded. Vulnerable to invasion and attack. But there's this also this picture, logic becomes as knots. Somehow the plague was that what you trusted in is going to become cancerous, like, like rust corroding steel, and it'll just disintegrate, like moths eating through wool. And it's like, whatever you think you have, you'll be betrayed by it, if it's not Yahuwah. And it lines up with the commandment of the, of the Ten Commandments. Gosh, I, should, you know, I keep running into the same trouble. Why don't I just write this down? No false witness. The interesting thing is that there's another factor in here that there's light for those who repent. So at this particular stage, he offers this, no, excuse me, burning angle, that was the next one, no, that one was do not steal, vulnerable borders. The next one, well, this one, the next one, no false witness, that's the uh, plague number nine, the Ten of the Ten Commandments, it's number nine. It, it was the darkness. But there was light for those who repent. Another way to read what was going on there was sent overwhelming ignorance. That's the word chosak, or darkness. Mm -hmm. Ignorance, awful gloom, depression, constriction, I, I, I hear these words and it makes me think of Alzheimer's, autism, mm. Parkinson's, immobilization, mm. confining oppression. But there's light for those who repent. In other words, these things are not putting blame on anybody that has these ailments, but they're pictures. If I read through this list of stuff we were talking about, I can see this stuff happening in America. There's an overwhelming sir, of of autism and Alzheimer's mm -hmm. and cancer mm -hmm. and anarchy mm -hmm. and revolution mm -hmm. and violence and a disintegration of the culture and of everything that was been built over the last couple centuries and on and on. I mean, I can sit here and apply every single one of these things to what's happening in the United States here at 2018. Oh. The next one, the tenth one, where the, just, just for what it's worth, hang, hang, hang on, just, just a minute, just, just, just a minute. Here. Just for the audience information. Just for the audience information, we looked at this nice room at the Inn at Knowles Hill, and so now we have a token of what the Inn at Knowles Hill has to offer. Oh, no. there it is. Look at that. Home Home made, made from scratch. Pretzels. Could you describe Hot, that? soft, yeasty, with fresh cheddar cheese sauce. 
<laughs> this, this is the wonder of being married to Rhonda. <laughs> this, this is what happens on a regular basis around so, here. So if you want to keep talking, that's fine. We just got, we just got two more things. We're, we're, we're almost done. He's at 50 minutes already. <laughs> what do you guys think? <laughs> huh? Huh? Should he keep talking? <laughs> wrap it up, Eric. These wrap it up. Wrap we can do more videos. Okay. Okay. These don't stick Thank warm forever. <laughs> the tenth plague was the death of the firstborn. Yahuwah, in doing this, you know, I've heard it said that the Egyptian firstborn were killed because they were sinners. And the Israel's firstborn were not killed because they had the blood on the doorpost, which was a symbol of the blood of the Messiah, and that's why, because their sins were forgiven. And it's like, wait a minute. You look back at the story, and that's not why the firstborn of the Egyptians were killed. If I read the story, the information given, and I know that in Christian doctrine you look and you find parallels and all this stuff, and I'm not making comment about that, but if you read the story, why were the Egyptian firstborn killed? Do you know? Do you, do you recall what, again, just calling out of the blue here for you. <laughs> I don't remember offhand. It's been a while. Since okay, the, Yahweh the last said, last Passover. He said, I am the creator of heaven and the earth. The firstborn of any creature, human or animal, is my personal possession. Okay. And he said, right. I, he said, Israel is my firstborn. So now he's claiming that the entire people group of Israel mm -hmm. is the firstborn, which is his personal possession. But he's also making the statement, because he's the creator and maker of heaven and earth, that the firstborn of all the Egyptians, of both humans and animals, mm -hmm. are his personal possession. And he says, if you don't let go, Mr. Pharaoh, my firstborn Israel, I'm going to take your firstborn, who are my own personal possession. I'm going to pick up my poison and leave. I'm not going to. I'm going to take my personal possession away from you. He did not steal the Egyptians' possessions from them. He took his own personal possessions away from them. And it meant by killing them, but it's his prerogative because he is the Elohim of all the earth. And if he chooses to do that, it's his prerogative with his own possessions. So it was because Pharaoh refused to release Yahweh's firstborn that he killed Pharaoh's firstborn. That's what he said. Direct retaliation. So what's the statement? What is he saying? He's not Mr. Nice Guy. He's saying that this is who he is. He's the owner and possessor of heaven and earth, and when he makes up certain rules, like this people group is my firstborn, and that people group is my personal possession, and these animals are mine, and I'll let you use them if you go along with me, we better respect him. Okay, the last thing having to do with wiping out the Egyptian army in the Sea of Reeds, Yom Suf, control and sovereignty over nature, manipulating laws of physics at his whim, he is empathetic to care for his own people, which is just outrageous. So in other words, I'm trying to read past the events to see the message within the story. Again, we need to stop with this. If we look at the correlation to the constellations, that's a whole other thing. I could run through real quick if you want. Betula lining up with the staff turning into the Tanin. Libra, the river of blood. Scorpio with the frog. Sagittarius with the lice or vermin. Capricorn with the swarm. Aquarius, the livestock plague. Pisces, dust bowls, dust and boils. Aries, the fire and hail. Taurus, the locust. Gemini, the darkness. Cancer, the death of the firstborn. And Leo, these are... Uh, modern names of the constellations. An interesting thing about how, is, you know, when I when I and I say this, I bring this up for a point. You know, you you see Gemini, that's the twins, and it's like, well, what's that supposed to mean? And if I line it up with this, and I say, well, that has to do with Alzheimer's and autism, and what does that even mean? It's like, it's like for, it's like he says, listen, if you don't acknowledge me, it's like you're trapped in in a shadow. You don't. You see somebody who has autism, 
Alzheimer's, they're not themselves. They look like themselves, but they're not themselves. It's like there's, it's almost like a schizophrenia. You know, they're not allowed to be themselves. They're, they're locked up. They're in, in some kind of a prison that's not even their fault, which is just this oppression. And it's almost like, well, there's, there's two people. I know there's a real person in there, but they can't get out. They, they can't manifest, and they can only kind of push through a few human attributes. And it's just this horrible... he's saying that we don't have to suffer that if he was on the throne if he had us doing what we were supposed to be doing one way to read those 12 stones it says that there was an orim and tumim I'm, I'm now going back on the video we made earlier I've heard it said I've read in a book from a lady talking about physics that somehow that people picture these as two almost like magic stones that they because this Hosen was folded, there was a pocket, and they dropped the stones in there, and then the stones went almost like acting like a Ouija board, that when the, the high priest would come and ask a question of Elohim, they'd light up and flash, and they'd be able to read information. But the thing is, the word orim, the, 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 the suffix im means plural, it's a plural reference, or is the word light. So it's actually lights, mm -hmm. and tom, tomim, tom means perfect. perfect, so it means perfect specimens which conduct light. So I'm thinking, well, it's not two magic special stones that they dropped in behind. Those are two quality aspects of what each one of these 12 specimens are supposed to be. And if the specimens of stones were supposed to correlate to the tribes of Israel, in a way it's saying that if each of the 12 tribes would behave tom as they're supposed to, perfectly, without art, without doing their own stuff, and were conducting his light responsibly, then there's something about the names of those stones which are a way of Yahuwah himself to emanate through his people. It's the same way that you have this rock, and there's no water in the desert. And he told Moshe on two occasions. One occasion to go up and hit the rock with his staff, and the second occasion just to go up and speak. And out of this rock, the rock burst open, and there's a picture in this book. You can see the rock. They found the rock. It, 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 it split, and it's out there in the Saudi Arabian desert to this day, and they can see where millions of gallons of water poured out of this rock, filled up, made a whole lake that all the people were able to drink. Rock and, created a stream. and I believe that that is a prophetic picture of what would happen if we, ourselves, this generation, this day, 2000, in front of us, 19, would come back to these words and conduct ourselves according to what he said, that this world will be like just speaking his words will crack open and his refreshing will pour out and water the earth. And it's us behaving like Moshe. If we would gaze at his words, his commandments, his instructions, in awe, in wonder, and in hearing, and doing, and guarding, and keeping, just Quit working on the Sabbath day. Regard his Moedim. Understand his name. Call upon his name. Trust him to do what he said. Somehow that will split the rock, pour out a refreshing of revitalization to this earth. And I don't think that it's mandated that, that the tribulation has to be upon us imminently, as some people have said. That's basically the point of what this is about. Anything you got to say that we got to share? Well, I'll, I'll share that Rhonda just shared with me that this is the perfect time to eat those pretzels. <laughs> There's a window. And she knows. Mm -hmm. Trust me, she knows. <laughs> <laughs> we'll pick it up tomorrow. We'll do some more videos tomorrow. Only be strong and very courageous. Hallelujah. Great discussion, you guys. Good stuff.